Why China is not the rising global superpower that Ray Dalio thinks they are. Now this is a follow-up to last week's video where we looked at our rapidly changing global monetary order by analyzing the recent book from Ray Dalio that he's done titled The Changing World Order. Now we've all heard that the 19th century was dominated by the British. The 20th century belonged to the United States Empire. And now many are saying the 21st century will be ruled by the rising Chinese Empire. However, I don't believe they're as powerful as many believe they are because of a number of economic, geopolitical, and resource-related headwinds that go largely unspoken about in the mainstream media, not to mention what's unfolding in China right now. I mean, they're violently locking up their own citizens inside their homes today, right now, as we speak. They're losing control of their once obedient citizens and civil unrest is one of the fastest growing threats. So in this video, I'm gonna break all of this down. I'm gonna show you which country I believe is best positioned to be the dominant superpower for the rest of the 21st century. So let's go. All right, welcome back. If you're new to the channel, my name is Mark Moss and I make these videos to change the way you think about money because almost everything that you've been taught is wrong. That's right. It's that bad, but that's okay. We're going to expose this. We're going to give you a different way to look at this. I do want to let you know uh, if you can check out a link down below to marketdisruptorslive.com, a live event I'm having with about 15 of the top experts in the world getting together live and in person to tell you what's going to happen and what you should be doing about this with your finance. I'm talking about names like George Gammon, Harry Dent, Daniel DiMartino Booth, Luke Grauman, uh, Robert Breedlove. The list goes on. Check it out, marketdisruptorslive.com. Okay, so back to the video. So to start off the long list of problems that China has on their hands that could prevent them from taking over the superpower position of the world that many think is inevitable at this point, let's start with the demographics, which uh, demographics is the characteristics of human populations and population segments. Now, especially when it's used to identify consumer markets. So China has some of the worst demographics in the entire world, and this is why it's important. Now, I recently did an interview with cycle specialist Harry Dent, and uh, we'll link it right up here. And we talked about the importance of demographics and their role in shaping our global economy and how having poor demographics is bad for an economy because the, the boomers, the old people, they simply they spend less money and they consume less goods than younger people. Now, demographics expert Peter Zahan even claims that the reason Russia recently invaded Ukraine in 2022 was because if they waited any longer, their population would be too old to fight a war. Now, older people also tend to save more money, and this is seen as a bad thing for economic growth and economic activity. But mostly it's a problem because it's expensive to take care of old people and we need new younger people to create the economic activity to pay for them and for the entitlements. Uh, speaking of entitlements, there's somewhere around $200 trillion of unfunded liabilities just here in the United States alone. Now in today's inflationary monetary system that we have, it requires consumption at all costs. And our favorite central planners, they're concerned about people not taking on more debt, framing you know, responsible financial decisions like saving as an actual bad thing. They call it a savings glut. I mean, how dare you save money for a rainy day, right? <laughs> now switching gears for a little bit, let's break down what poor demographics look like. They're represented by the negative growth column that you can see up in the chart that I have on the screen right now. Notice how a large percentage of the population is over the age of 40. Now, with this in mind, we can see China has some of the worst demographics in the entire world today. But how did they get here? Was this all just a coincidence? Was it natural? Well, it's important to remember the majority of the world was very afraid of what we call these Mathusian fear spells being cast back in the 1970s. Fears of peak oil were running rampant. The CCP was horrified at having a repeat of the famine that killed tens of millions of people, Chinese people, between 1958 and 1962. So that's why China decided to implement something called a one child policy back in 1979 to slow down the population growth. Now this policy caused China's population growth rate to fall to a 61 year low recently. Now seen differently, we can see the proportion of people over the age of 65 has grown while the population aged under 14 has shrunk massively since the 1979 policy blunder. 
Now, due to this demographic crisis, the CCP has recently come out and reversed course on this controversial policy. In 2015, the CCP allowed people to begin having, wait for it, two kids. <laughs> And only last year, in mid-2021, they further admitted how horrible these, pro these policies were and announcing that uh, now Chinese citizens could have three kids in an attempt to increase population growth. But it's too little too late, right? They've had decades of low birth rates and most of the children were born were males. And now we have hundreds of millions of males running around with no females, <laughs> which as you might guess is a recipe for disaster and there's no quick, there's no easy fix for that. Now, just when you thought their demographics issue was bad, China's also experiencing an energy and a water crisis. 80% of China's power capacity comes from coal, hydro, and nuclear power sources. Coal, hydro, and nuclear power generation all require one thing, that's huge amounts of water in order to function efficiently. Now this heavy reliance on coal makes its power grid very one dimensional and fragile. And this is a really big problem for them. I'm gonna get into that in a minute. But coal power in particular also requires large amounts of water at every stage, including mining, washing, and cooling during the thermal power cycle. Now China is heavily reliant on water for their energy grid. So as you might imagine, it'd be a big issue if they didn't have large water reserves, right? Well, China has 20% of the world's population, but only 7% of the world's freshwater resources. Now this chart that I have up on the screen shows that as of 2014, over 15 states in China are defined as experiencing severe water scarcity. Now this problem has only gotten worse as China drains its critical aquifer water reserves and it's contaminated their existing water supply. So it's a big problem for them. All right, then we have the energy crisis China's facing. A combination of lower rainfall and rising commodity prices has plunged China into an energy crisis in 2021. Now the problem is most concentrated in Northern China, which accounts for more than 60% of China's agriculture land and 40% of China's population, while possessing only 20% of the nation's freshwater resources. Now it's these structural water shortages that may also account for North China's collapsing share of national GDP, which has plummeted since 2013 as businesses flee from Northern China as water and energy restrictions make doing business there nearly impossible. Now agriculture accounts for approximately 60% of China's water consumption and the impending water crisis threatens future food crops. Now could this suggest why China stockpiled 60% of the world's grains in 2021. Now, China's government is well aware of the need to address the structural water shortage. In 2005, Chinese Premier Wen Yiabo remarked that water shortages threatened, quote, the survival of the Chinese nation. Now, let's take a moment to dwell on the significance of that statement. For a country that tries to exude strength and dominance, don't you guys think this is a significant statement for the almighty Chinese empire to make? They're admitting defeat. They're showing weakness. Now, the water crisis is also exposing China's reliance on coal for energy because coal resources are mismatched with water resources. As of 2015, 67% of China's coal plants were in regions considered water stressed or even highly water stressed. Now this chart that I have up shows all the provinces in China that are currently rationing power and energy usage due to this crisis. I think that the crackdown on power consumption mentioned above is being driven by rising demand for electricity and surging coal and gas prices, as well as strict targets from Beijing to cut emissions. Now, the energy restrictions are affecting the country's mammoth manufacturing industries as the price of Chinese commodities is soaring. From aluminum smelters to textiles producers, soybean processing, plant factories, they're all being ordered to curb their activity or in some instances to even shut down production altogether. Even Apple, the world's largest company, a $3 trillion giant, has had to restrict energy uses at its factories in China due to the energy shortage. And if they're restricting energy to Apple, imagine how many other companies are being shut off first. Now also, here's a fun fact. Did you know that the typical smartphone requires 3,000 gallons of water to produce? 
It's interesting. Now, while the rest of the world is currently reducing their consumption of the dirtiest fossil fuel coal because countries have agreed to move to more renewable energy sources, well, there's also infamously caused the soaring energy prices in the EU, UK, and, and in the West over the past couple of years. And we've been talking about it a lot here on this channel. Now, while that's all happening, China, who famously didn't attend the Global Climate Conference in Glasgow in November 2021, is ignoring the global green agenda because it cannot afford to wean itself off dirty coal. Chinese coal production in December 2021 hit an all-time high of 384 million tons, up 20% in just the last year alone. Now, to shift gears a little bit, the fact China is dealing with an energy crisis combined with their communist ideals positions them to oppose transformative technologies like Bitcoin. In 2020, China housed 60% of the global Bitcoin mining and accounted for more than 1% of China's total power consumption. And forecasts in early 2021 suggested that Bitcoin mining would consume nearly 4% of China's annual electricity output by 2024. Now that kind of demand load on an already strained electric grid was likely a factor in why Chinese authorities banned all cryptocurrency mining back in June of 2021. At the time, the Chinese grid was about to be hit with a seasonal high demand period in summer. Now, yes, I think that China's Orwellian plans with their central bank digital currency was also a contributing factor to banning Bitcoin, AKA what I like to say, freedom money. But many seem to be discounting the potentially larger reason behind the ban, being that the current Chinese energy crisis. But many seem to be discounting the potentially larger reason behind the ban, which is the current Chinese energy crisis. Now, excluding yourself from a potentially transformative technology and innovation in Bitcoin places China at a significant disadvantage for the coming century. There's also big problems with their economy. And so economically, China is an absolute basket case. Now I did a video talking about the $1 trillion debt problem that's blowing up right now because of their high-speed rail lines editor. Let's go ahead and link that video up here. And China is sitting on the world's largest pile of melting ice cubes in the form of worthless FX reserves, foreign currency reserves. In a recent video, we explained why holding FX reserves have now been shown to be completely useless in this new Bretton Woods three era, where foreign exchange reserves can be frozen at a whim which of course the Russia central bank discovered the hard way. Now reserve currency requires trust. It requires an open capital markets. And this is an issue for China because it doesn't wish to open its capital markets and give strong property rights to foreigners who want to invest. We can, however, see it's increased its share of global FX reserves. However, this has largely only occurred through loans made in their belt and road initiative. Now many people ask, why can't China just step up and attempt to offer the CNY, their NIMBY, as the global reserve currency. Well, many analysts don't understand that China doesn't want to be the global reserve currency because it would require them to have to depeg from the dollar. Now, this would strengthen the yuan against the dollar and make their exports more expensive and less attractive. China is the world's largest exporter around the world, accounting for 15% of global exports, and its economy is very reliant on its exporting ability. Becoming the reserve currency and subsequently letting the yuan strengthen against the dollar would hurt China's biggest strength. In Ray Dalio's research, he correctly highlights how the share of the US global GDP is declining and China is rising. However, something he fails to mention is throughout history, the rising global superpower is normally in a more healthy economic situation than the declining empire. Today, this isn't the case. China has an enormous debt crisis and is far more indebted than the U.S. empire. Now, not many Western countries are in a position that's much better than the U.S. fiscal situation. In this era of globalized economies and an interconnected banking system, if one nation has a large default and crisis, it would also hurt its major trading partners who are all equally as fragile. So, China's facing all these uphill battles, which don't often get spoken about in the mainstream press. All we're continually told by the mainstream media is that we should fear China because they're a long-term strategic thinking country and they're gonna take over the world, right? And I think people are overlooking these major issues that China's facing. But what do you guys think after watching that? Can China really become the next rising empire when they're contending with all these big issues? What do you think was the bigger reason behind Chinese Bitcoin mining ban? 
And does anyone have any other theories surrounding the Chinese Bitcoin mining ban? I'd love to hear it down below. Let me know what you think in the comments. Of course, as always, give me a thumbs up on this video if you like it. If you don't like the video, that's okay. Give me a thumbs down, but at least leave me a comment and let me know why. And that's what I got for today. All right, to your success. I'm out.